So I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to have Phil because I do think this is really important. Um, I'm curious, how many of you have heard maybe one or two mentions of either AI or chat GPT so far? A little bit. A little, a little bit. bit. How yeah. many of you have heard in the same conversation discussions of the words truth or trust? Well, that's good. That's, that's somewhat encouraging because I find oftentimes we're not discussing these things. And equally important is the idea of trust. And you can trust something that isn't true and something can be true and not trust it. We have a little bit of a problem of that um, in the United States where I come from. So I want to I wanna talk about these topics in the context of AI, but also in the context of the companies that are building this. Um, uh, Phil, Phil and I both have a little gray hair, I dye mine, but you know, having been around the tech industry for a while, I don't know, are we at all surprised that we are where we are in this moment where the technology is incredibly powerful and the companies are not necessarily more trustworthy uh, than they were when the technologies were less powerful? I, I'm a little bit surprised. Uh, I, I was hoping for for for, for something better. Uh, I think maybe uh, maybe I think a certain amount of idealistic optimism is required in in the industry. And uh, uh, I have been a big proponent, a big believer in the long term positive nature of AI, uh, and I still am. Uh, but I was a little bit surprised at what I think is the kind of the the wrong turn that that a lot of the hype took a few months ago around some of these new large language models like ChatGPT. And then at the same time, um, how there's just, it seems like there's this giant trust gap inside of companies. Um, that, that, that is, it's always been there a little bit, but now it just seems like almost every CEO that I talk to, I think literally, I'm, not, I'm trying to not exaggerate, I think most CEOs think that most of their employees don't do anything. And I think most employees think that they're about to be laid off or their company doesn't believe in them or trust them or look out for them. And so you've got this, uh, you've got this crisis in uh, employee-employer trust. You've got this crisis in consumer trust. You've got whole industries like crypto saying, oh, trust isn't even important. Like, you, you, sh you can operate without trust. And then that's running directly into this AI stuff, which, uh, yeah, just makes it infinitely possible to make relatively plausible lies very quickly. So it's, a, it's going to be a turbulent couple of years. So I want us to end up back with the technology and where we're headed, but I want to, I want to go through that path, starting with what's happening inside the companies. Yeah. Help, help though for folks that aren't inside these companies, you know, why does it matter beyond being a labor issue this, and it's a pretty radical change. I mean, a lot of these companies, if you remember it, or for those who don't, you know, there was a time when Google allowed every employee access to every document within, within the company. There was, uh, Facebook had a similar policy. There was this idea that, you know, you were building something together, it only works if we trust each other, um, we're paying these employees a fortune, of course we should trust them. And some of that, you know, went back. The tech industry, as we know, you know, if you caught even half of Scott Galloway's slides, you know, we've had a 14-year boom. Like many of today's tech workers have never experienced a layoff. Why does it matter? And why does it matter, especially at this moment, that we have a change in the dynamics? Why should anyone who doesn't work for a tech company care? I mean, I think if you got half of Scott Galloway's slides, that's pretty impressive because there's a lot of a lot of slides. I think I got like 10%, and even that was impressive. Um, look, I think uh, I think the big division right now that's happening is uh, in, of, of companies. It's not between companies that are going back to the office or, or, or being remote. It's between high trust and low trust. There are many, many, many companies that are reverting to low trust tactics um, that basically say. If I can't see you working, I don't believe that you're working. Uh, and, and, and I never want to be in that position, just purely as a human being. Like if I was at the start of my career right now, I would do everything possible to make sure that I never got stuck working at a company that didn't trust me. I just wouldn't put myself in that situation. I would never allow that with my friends or with my family, but I spend more time working than I do with my friends or my family, so why would I allow that where I work? 
So we're trying very much to say, okay, how do we become, how do we maintain being a very high trust team, but a high trust team that's actually effective? Um, and it's, it's, it's hard, it's different. We've had to really change the way that we think about uh, how we communicate, how many meetings we have, whether we have meetings or not. Uh, because a lot of things that companies do are, are, are low trust control methods. And I think it matters because the relationship between employees and employers, especially in tech, has always been pretty fundamentally dishonest. Um, Reid Hoffman wrote a great book about this many years ago called The Alliance. Uh, where he basically says that uh, there's, this, there's this fundamental dishonesty between how, how companies and employees talk to each other, where they both talk to each other as if this relationship was like a lifetime relationship. They talk about it like it's a family, but they both know that it's not a long-term relationship, that the average length of time that a tech employee spends at their job is like two years or even less than that. And if you, if you actually read the contracts, it all says, you know, at will and any of that kind of stuff. So there's always been this like dishonesty on, on both sides, uh, and of course these are the people and these are the organizations that are creating most of the things that we use as a society. So you've got technology coming out of, of an environment that's fundamentally dishonest to begin with, uh, and, it, and it's troublesome, and I think that, 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 that dishonesty is kind of uh, infecting all other aspects of the world, and again, running into uh, consumer confidence and um, uh, and AI issues, so I think this year, I think 2023 is gonna be the year where epistemology really matters for the first time ever. Epistemology, you know, the study of what, what is truth, how do we believe in something, how do we agree on something, what is our societal infrastructure for actually knowing what is something we should agree on is uh, gonna become, I think, the most important issue in the world this year. And I'm gonna take us to the low point, and then I promise we're gonna to get to better stuff. How much of this do you think, um, or the acceleration of it, should we blame Elon Musk for? I mean, I don't disagree with Scott's slide, apologies for the Elon Musk reference, but I don't disagree that there are a lot of CEOs that are like, wow, this just gave me air cover to do a bunch of things, because the room to be evil and not Elon Musk, like there's, there's still a lot of room between like work from home only, don't work from home only, I'm not gonna pay the rent and bring me your code at the end of the day. Like you can be a better boss than that without doing, and still be a pretty shitty boss. Uh, I, I, I think it's maybe too easy and too tempting to blame any single person or Elon. I think, you know, Elon is an exceptional case, meaning like it's just, it's hard to draw too many lessons from Elon, he's just not like under the bell curve. He's kind of off to a side, for better and for worse. Um, I think like systemically, this 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 crisis, this gap of trust is like almost everywhere. I think it's probably for me, it's more interesting to look at uh, not how much of it is Elon's fault. I think at the end of the day, very little. He's just one one person, as one company. It's really what are the systems that are in place that allow this kind of thing. For example, we were. So when I was running Evernote, uh, you know, I was at Evernote for nine years, and I thought um, work was the most important thing in, in the world to me. Like, I, would, I was willing to sacrifice everything for work, and, uh, and it was difficult. The last couple of years, I, I, was, I wasn't very healthy, I had, you know, just gotten divorced, like it was, it was hard, I was really burned out, I think a lot of people were. And I thought, okay, I have to focus, I have to have this work-life balance, and I, now I have to focus on life, and so I spend, a few weeks doing that before I started working again. Uh, I'm gonna challenge you that that's actually balanced, but yeah. okay. Well, but, but the, the problem was that idea of work-life balance is a harmful idea. It's wrong, there is no such thing as work-life balance. There's only life. And work is a very important and meaningful part of it for most people, but we've all been told that there's this distinction. There's, there's work and there's life and you make compromises and you make trade-offs. And it's a, it's a kind of a inhumane and dishonest relationships. And so at the best of times, when companies are hiring people, um, not Twitter, companies that, 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 that try to treat their employees really well, it's still dishonest uh, because, of this, because of this inherent conflict and this inherent lack of trust. So because we're limited on time and I wanna get to the why this matters in an era of chat, GPT, and AI, 
talk through the benefits. So say you're doing this right. What are, what are the benefits of a high trust environment and acknowledging the realities? You, you're running a business, you, you, know, you have obligations that go above and beyond the employee. The employee has interests that may or may not involve them being at the company forever. What are the benefits of a lot of trust in that environment? I think, I think what I've realized over years of doing this uh, is, uh, so I, I moved, I was, in, I was in San Francisco for about 15 years and I moved about two years ago, I went to uh, Bentonville, Arkansas, uh, just almost at random. And um, people ask me frequently about why did you move to Arkansas? Because no one has ever moved to Arkansas before. I think I'm the first person that's ever done it. Uh, and I used to say like, well, I figured, you know, my company is fully remote and so I can, I can work from anywhere, so I may as well live somewhere nice. That was my reasoning. But what I realized is that's only half of it. The other half is that I can be better at work because I live somewhere nice. Because if you improve the quality of life, that leads to an improvement of the quality of work for creative people, for knowledge workers, for, for almost everyone in this room and almost all of the employees and the companies in this room, for people who work with their brains, you get higher quality work if you have a higher quality life. So if you let someone live in a nice place, in a good neighborhood and have time and, and not waste, you know, three hours every day sitting in traffic and have time for friends and family and music and art, you get more creativity, you get better work. And when you get better work, you get more success and more money. And you can invest that into making an even better lifestyle. So you get this like, you get this flywheel, right? Where improved quality of life, improves quality of work, improves quality of life. And that's the benefit. The benefit is why should you do this? Well, you should do this because for many, many, many types of jobs, this improves productivity, but also the improvement in productivity gives you more resources to put into improving your life, your neighborhood, your society. And, and the way that we, that we think about it is we look for things that prevent this flywheel from spinning. What are the things that prevent you from having a good quality of, of life? Oh, uh, meetings. Having too many meetings, for example, or commuting for multiple hours every day. These are things that prevent you from having a good quality of life and a good quality of work. So let's get rid of them. Let's try to figure out how to replace them with something else. And let's try to get that, that positive system going for as many people as possible. And now with AI, the current AIs are excellent at doing mediocre quality work. They can do mediocre quality work infinitely, forever, for free, which means there's no reason for mediocre quality work to exist. That's certainly the optimistic side. I want to confront one of the biggest challenges that we have at the moment, which is, um, so I wrote about this, I said, you know, the technology is scary good, and I firmly believe it's both of those things. And to me, the scariest part right now is it's, it's confidently, it's always confident. Sometimes it's r scary good because it's right. Sometimes it's just confidently wrong. Yeah. Um, are we doing a dangerous thing by not prioritizing something that tells you how confident it is, that tells you where it got its sources? Um, yeah. Is it okay to put engines like that into the world? Yeah, I think it's, it, it's very dangerous. Uh, and look, confident and wrong is kind of my move. Like that is the CEO skill. Mm -hmm. And so really our jobs are the most endangered by AIs because if it's gonna be good at just confidently saying incorrect things, then who needs me? Uh, so I have a particular vested interest in correcting this. Uh, and I, but I think, I think this point is, I wouldn't say that it's scary good. I would say that the current AIs are scary impressive. And there's a difference because when you evaluate almost anything else and you're impressed by it, like if you evaluate a, a chess playing AI, you're impressed by it when it is really good at playing chess and it defeats chess masters. If you evaluate a navigation system, you, you evaluate it if it's really good at like getting you to where you want to go. But the large language models like ChatGPT, they're not good at anything. They're trained at being impressive. They're impressive because they're trained to please you right now in the short term. So they're very plausible, they're very confident, they're very impressive, but they're not reasoning. They have no connection to facts and, 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 and rules and symbolic logic. They're just generating words, which basically makes them capable of, of producing things that are plausible, but disconnected from reality. And to tie a couple of things we've been talking about together, how much would be improved if, like on Wikipedia, where you have 
the thing, but then you flip it over and you have the sources, you have the debate, you have everything. And my second question is, shouldn't we be demand this? But how much better would it be if there was a way to flip it over and say, this is why I'm saying what it is, this is my source, and is that a reasonable thing to expect or demand from these companies? I think it's, I think it's a necessary thing as a society to demand. Uh, I don't, and the good news is there's lots of companies and people working on it. The bad news is this is not imminent. We're not close to it. Because again, things like ChatGPT are impressive, but they're not truthful. They're not, they're not accurate. I think it's gonna take, I think we'll get there, right? but I think it's years away, it's not months away. So all of the predictions about how AI is this year going to take over all these things, it's not. This year, it's gonna result in a flood of bullshit. This year, it's gonna result in 10,000 times more plausible lies and bullshit than we're used to dealing with as a society. A few years from now, when we actually build the kinds of layers you're talking about, it's gonna be useful. But in the meantime, what could we do as humans? So I think, I think we're in for a lot of pain because of AI right now, and then the really benefits are gonna happen, but the benefits are, I think, years away. So what can we do with them as people? Well, as individuals, I, I think it's pretty straightforward. One is, um, if you want to be trusted, you have to start by trusting people. Trust by default. You have to act in ways that are trustworthy. Um, I think the conversation is going to flip. You know, in the past couple of months, you're seeing on social media a lot of examples of people posting things that uh, AI does, uh, uh, images or, 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 or words. A lot of people are posting the AI stuff and saying, look how great this is. It could have been written by a person. It's not great, it's just impressive. I think now that's shifting, and I think this year that it's gonna shift and you're gonna see people posting things made by humans and saying, look how crappy this is, that could, this could have been made by an AI. I think we need to recalibrate our thinking. If, it, if an AI could have written it, then you shouldn't. If an AI could have drawn it, then you shouldn't. Don't be tempted to like use the AIs to like automate your work, to make it easier for you to generate low quality stuff because then no one's gonna trust you. That defeats the whole point. So like we have to, it's gonna take a couple of years for people working on different models of AI that'll actually be able to, 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 to work with reality to happen. There's lots of important work going on. In the meantime, we just have to like not be seduced to, uh, to, to, to scale up mediocrity. We need to like raise the bar for what it means that this is produced by a human. That is like a level of quality and originality. And that, should, that, that goes for writing and it goes for videos. You know, in, in my business, in, mm -hmm, we make video communication stuff, live and recorded. There's all sorts of AI video things. There's all sorts of things where you can like type something in and the AI will like write a whole script and then put a fake person reading stuff. It's gonna be mediocre. Don't do that. Because if you do that, you've taken the short-term win of making it easy for yourself to produce something mediocre, but you're also like helping erode this fabric of trust. Normally I like to end on a high note, but I'm kind of tempted to uh, end on a less high note. So we only have about 10 seconds, so really quickly, um, how dangerous do you think this period is? We're already in a dangerous period for democracy where you have an engine that is incredibly good at spewing out BS. Yeah, uh, uh, um, it's incredibly good at spewing out BS. Uh, it's a dangerous time. Look, I, think, I, I don't think this is world ending. I don't think it's as bad as like COVID. Like I think like humanity will get through this and it will be fine. We're just, you're just gonna see a lot more bullshit than you're used to seeing. And everyone already thinks that you have more bullshit than you wanna deal with in your life. It's about to get 100 times worse. But, and, and so certain things will stop working, like email. Email will probably stop working for all of you because like, I already know who you are, so if you text me, as long as like, your, you know, your iMessage is relatively authenticated, I'm happy to talk, but I'm never again gonna be able to like, look at an email from someone I don't know and decide whether that was a human or not because the AI can make infinite cold emails that are like, very convincing. So all sorts of like, the fabric of our society is gonna break, but that's great because we all hate email anyway, so this is now it's like the last time for it to happen. So lots of bad stuff this year but we'll get through it, not as bad as what we've just lived through. It's not literally a virus that may kill everyone. And I think we come out of it stronger as long as we, in the short term, insist on doing human level quality things. Don't be tempted by the machines to do mediocrity. And in the long term, fund startups and companies that are actually gonna make the next generation of AI, which actually will be useful. 
All right, so I'm gonna have to leave it there. So to recap, you're gonna be flooded with bullshit, but it's not as bad as COVID and you may get to get rid of email. Phil Libin, thank you so much. Thank you.